wonderful day as you uh, are here to worship. Worship in this place. Something special about this place. This is a building. It's, I would say four walls. It's a uniquely designed room. So it's not four walls, but it's just a building. But here, as God's children, we gather in this place to worship Him. And we ask Him to join us here with us where we pray, where we cry, where we worship Him. Well, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and, and turn with me. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1. We begin our new series as uh, once a month we're going to uh, take a time to look at portions of the Bible so that in a 12-month period we will cover the entire Bible. And uh, many of you have already picked up a Bible reading plan so you can read along and, and do so daily. If you have not picked one up, they're in the foyer. And yes, you may be five days behind so far, uh, but that's okay. So far, the reading has been light. In fact, several of you have already told me that you can't read just what's on, the, on there for one day. Because you want to continue on and we keep on going. Well, I know the reading is light right now, but that's so that each one of you can catch up. If you haven't gotten one, uh, go ahead and grab one today. You can easily catch up. Uh, not, it won't be much of an issue there. But I look forward to us together reading the Bible daily going through this uh, and seeing how every portion of God's Word points to the cross, points to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that He is the Messiah, He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, everything is about Jesus. And so today as we look at our first aspect, first section or division, uh, chapter of the Bible, uh, that is the awesomeness of creation. Creation done God's way. As we begin here in Genesis chapter 1, I want you to know that great things happen when God is allowed to be in charge. When we set aside our purposes and our likes and our dislikes, and we put God on the throne, and we allow Him to be in charge, great things happen. I mean, you can't help but read Genesis 1 and see how great our God is. We have the six-day creation. A, a literal six days, God created everything. Uh, and and we, we know this. We know Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then as we see how each one of these is designed and created by God, in day one, in verses 1 through 5, we have light. His light that was created to shine. Day two. Verses 6 through 8, we have the firmament and the water. In other words, the waters were separated from the earth. So there's the water in space, water here on the earth. Uh, it was without form and void, and you had the firmament. Then on day 3, he began to, to shake things up. And land and the waters were separated, and then vegetation began to grow in verses 9 through 13. And on day 4, verses 14 through 19, the sun and the moon and the stars. And if you were here for our creation series that we had, this right here, this point right here on day 4 proves that if you are a Christian and you say, oh, well, the earth is still billions, if not, maybe just billions, but maybe possibly even billions of years old, this right here, as we read this, proves that could not happen. If you believe in a day-age theory, or a gap theory, or some other type of theory, uh, these days do not represent periods of time. They represent a day. Because he, he created vegetation on day three. Day four, he created the sun, which our young children told us that sun is necessary for seeds to grow, for vegetation to grow. It was only a 24-hour period between when vegetation started and the sun was created. It was not over thousands or millions or billions of years because that vegetation would have died without the necessary nourishment of the sun. Day 5, verses 20 through 23, we have the sea creatures and the birds that God created. And then on day 6, verses 24 through 31, God created all land creatures, including man and woman. They are uh, here throughout the creation. And I don't know about you, but have you ever looked at a maybe a sunrise or a sunset and just looked at that and said, wow. Or maybe you've gone to the mountains or to the beach 
And you look out at God's creation and you were in awe of what he did. For me, I love to stand on a tee box at a golf course that is in pristine condition. It's a beauty to, to behold and I say, wow! You might have your own spot. You may have this place in the world that you go to and when you look at that you say, God is incredible at how he created all this. And he did so in six literal days. But the prize jewel, the, 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 the greatest of all of his creation is what we see next, and that's the creation of man and woman. Even when you look at that gorgeous sunset or sunrise or, or that ocean front view or that mountain range or whatever it is that, that just makes you go, wow, God's greatest creation, even above all that beauty, is you. When God created man and woman, we see that in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28, and then also over in chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. But let's look here in verse, chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, who's us? Trinity. Yeah, thank you. Y'all paying attention. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were there at creation. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle and all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, yes, there is wonderful things that God created, even squirting cucumbers and exploding trees. Those are unique and wonderful and majestic in how God designed those. But the greatest thing He created was you. You are above everything. You are above uh, anything else that you can ever imagine of God's creation. He loves you, cherishes you, He values you that much. And so you are the prize jewel of this creation. And because of that, because you are so much more special than anything else, anything else in creation, God has given us the ability to have a relationship with Him. That's what's so unique about how good God is. He didn't design us to be mindless robots or for Him to be some uh, a ruler sitting on His chair and, and, and looking out how to be the puppet master. No. He designed you with a relationship in mind. His desire is to have a relationship with you, to know you, and for you to know Him. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And so he said, I heard your voice in the garden. Now, this part of the story of creation is when Adam and Eve sinned. They have now disobeyed God's command, and they have messed up. They have sinned. But what I see in this portion of the story is that Adam and Eve, before they, they sinned, before that, they already knew God. They already had a relationship with Him. Because this says there, as Adam is telling us, that uh, they heard the footsteps of God. And they heard the voice of God. I mean, that tells me that they walked with God. They knew what God looked like. And they knew what His voice sounded like. They had a relationship with God. That's why He designed you. That's why He created you. Is to have a relationship with Him. When God is allowed to be in control, His ways are perfect. And he has a perfect plan for you in your life if you only let him be in control. Unfortunately, bad things happen when man is in control. When you and I take over, when you and I have our way, when mankind does what man wants to do, bad things tend to happen. One is because it's a result of our own sin. Our sin, the things that we do, brings on the consequences. If we go back and look at Adam and Eve, there in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desire, desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Adam and Eve were given instructions of not to eat from this one tree. And so the, the serpent, the devil, Satan, comes in, deceives them, tells them a, a half-truth, which is a whole lie, and deceives them, and now they go against what God's told them to do. They're in direct defiance to God. It's just like children, parents. You've seen this happen. You told your child, don't do this or go do this right now. And the next thing you know, they have done the exact opposite. I mean, y'all come and bear witness, right? It's not just my kids, right? Well, as parents, you see your children do this. And children, you, or you, some children that are in here, you know it's true. You know we've been given uh, times when specific things to do. Do this or don't do this. And we do the exact opposite. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did. But you and I do it with God all the time. Our direct violation to God's laws, God's statutes. And there are results to our sins. These are direct consequences. As we see in chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, that there is now pain and suffering and hard work that will take place on earth as a direct result of sin. Adam and Eve also lost their home as a direct result of their sin. That's seen in Genesis 3, 23 and 24. Also, sickness and death are now a result of sin. Just in the next chapter, chapter 4, Two of their very own, Cain and Abel, go out together and only one comes back. Because sin is now in the world, there's now death. Not only do we see death, we actually see murder here in the Bible. All because of sin. And as the Bible teaches us, hell is a direct result of sin. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's meaning an eternity separated from God because of our sin. But not only is there direct consequences to our sin, there's also results of other people's sins. <coughs> other people in this world have sin, and now we all suffer because of it. Noah is a prime example of that. So we're going to fast forward now to, to chapter 6 here in the book of Genesis and look at the life of Noah. A righteous man after God's own heart. We read that in chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. So here is a good man, a man who sought to please God, a, a man who, who rose above. He was the, the cream of the cross as far as living the Christian life. But Noah suffered consequences. Not as a direct result of his own sin, which he did. He was, he was human. He was not perfect. So he did mess up on his own. But he suffered because of the sins of many others. These are indirect consequences. In Genesis 6, verses 5 and following, we read, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birth of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So because of the wickedness of mankind, there's now destruction, devastation, Death. And we still see that today. Maybe not so that you did specifically, but just because of the wickedness of mankind, there's now destruction in the world. But you know what? Sometimes it's not only a direct sin 
or even other people's sins, sometimes it's just because. Well, I want us to fast forward. Now, I know that in your Bible, and you probably did not bring a chronological Bible with you today, you probably brought a traditional Bible, it's like mine today. Uh, the Bible has books that fall in a certain order. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Second Samuel, 1 Second Kings, 1 Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Let's stop right there. Now, I, I read a whole lot. I didn't count how many that was. You might count it. I have 50 or so. But I, I read up a lot of names in the books of the Bible between Genesis to Job. Do you know what the first book of the Bible was that was written? Most people, most scholars believe it was Job. Now, there's some debate over oh, oh, that very fast. There's some debate over who actually wrote it. Most scholars believe that Moses wrote Job, and they, they wrote it before he wrote the book of Exodus. I'm one of those. I, I have no reason to dispute that. So I believe that Moses wrote the book of Job, and he did it first. Why would he write the book of Job first? I believe it's because the Israelites need to hear it. As they're wandering through the wilderness, they needed to be constantly reminded of the life of Job, even more so than the, the wonderful hand of God's creation as we see in Genesis. The Job suffered not because of his own sin, even though he was a sinner. He was a man. He sinned, his wife sinned, his, his children sinned. There was sin in their lives, but he suffered not because of that. And yes, there was sin all around him. But that was not the reason why Job suffered. Job suffered just because. Just because sometimes bad things happen to good people. We see that in, in Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 19, where Job lost almost everything that he had. He, he lost his property. He lost his valuables, his possessions. He lost a good portion of his family. Even his wife and his best friends were not good to him during this, this painful time in his life. <coughs> Bad things happen to good people all the time. We see it all around us. Maybe you've experienced some bad things in your life that were not a direct result of your own doing. Maybe you're experiencing them right now. Maybe you're going through one of the hardest times of your life. And you don't know what to do next. You don't know where to turn. And you're saying, why, God? I didn't bring this on. I didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes bad things happen just because. Yes, there is sin in the world. And sin has brought these bad things on. But you may not necessarily be the culprit in this case. Just because. Just because. And that's hard for me to even say as a preacher. And I know it's hard for you to hear as, as a church member. You're sitting there going, that's not fair. <clears throat> yeah. Life is not designed to be fair. And it won't be perfected until we get to reach heaven. That's why it's so important that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you invite Christ into your life, just as I was sharing this with our children just a little while ago, it's so important that we let Him come into our hearts, become Lord of our lives. That doesn't mean to take away the problems. No, you're still going to have consequences to your own sin. And there will still be uh, indirect consequences to other people's sins. And yeah, there's still going to be times that bad things happen, even when we did nothing to warrant it. That's because life is not perfect. But if you are a child of God, you have one, someone who's walking with you. Someone who is there and never going to leave you or forsake you. Who's going to walk with you and carry you through the difficult times. That's what we're going to see next. But also, you have something that's better that's waiting for you. You know, life is not perfect, but heaven is. And that's what he has waiting for you. So, in light of all this, of all the, the bad things that happen to good people, the bad things that happen when man is in control, where is Jesus in all this? How can we look at Genesis chapters 1 through 11 and now look at the, the life of Job, which I can't believe we just did in about five minutes because Job is such an incredible book. We have to take a month just going through the book of Job at least. 
Now, as we look at, at these three characters, Adam and Eve, Noah, Joe, where is Jesus in all of this? First of all, Jesus walked with Adam and Eve. We, we read about that. That they, they heard his footsteps in the garden. They heard his voice. They saw him. They spoke to him. They talked with God. Who was this God? That's Jesus. When do we see God in the flesh? We first see him in the New Testament, the, the, the little baby in the manger who grew up to take on the, the sins of the world as he died on the cross. That's God in the flesh. There are other times in the Bible that we can see Jesus make a, an Old Testament appearance, and we'll get to that as we go through the Bible. But here, as Adam and Eve are walking in the garden, talking with God, Face to face, as you and I are here in this room, they're doing so with Jesus Christ. Jesus made a blood sacrifice to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. Just like he made a blood sacrifice to cover your sins and mine. He took an animal and killed it, shed its blood, and took the, the skin from that animal to make a covering for Adam and Eve to hide their nakedness and their shame from the sin that they had committed by defying God. That blood shed to take away their, their shame is representative of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross to take away your sin and my sin. <coughs> then as we look at the life of Noah, Jesus is the one who closed the door for Noah. After everyone was in the ark, all the animals and now the eight people of Noah's family are all safe and secure. Jesus closes the door from the outside as seen in Genesis chapter 7 verse 16. God made a covenant with Noah and Jesus is the fulfillment of that covenant. In Genesis 6 18, just like throughout numerous times in the Old Testament, God made covenants. God made promises to, to the people throughout the generations. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all. Jesus is what we look to and the, the fulfillment of all our promises. When we look to Job, where was Jesus? Where was Jesus when Job was suffering without cause? When Job was saying, I didn't, I didn't do this, I didn't bring this on. Where was Jesus? Well, Jesus was Job's redeemer and mediator. In Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, Job is speaking of a redeemer. And then three times, Job asked for a mediator between him and God. Well, Jesus is our redeemer of our sins. And he's also our mediator between us and God. He is our high priest that goes in approaches the throne of God on our behalf. But then also, Jesus suffered for Job. Yeah, Job was a righteous man. We read about how good he was and how he was better than, than everybody else in the eyes of God. And even in his righteousness, he still suffered. But Jesus, Jesus was truly innocent. Job was a man. He committed sin. He, he was not perfect. Jesus was. He was sinless, truly innocent and righteous. And he suffered so that he could rescue Job, but he also could rescue you. You in your place, wherever you are in your life, whatever it is that you're going through, Jesus Christ is the only one who can rescue you. He's the only one who died on the cross to take away your sins. He's the only one that can make you right with God. He is our redeemer. He is our mediator. He is our rescuer to, to take away our sins. And Jesus wants to be with you. No matter what it is you're going through, He wants to be with you in the midst of your trials and tribulations. He wants to wipe away every sin by His blood. Just like he did with Adam and Eve. And he wants to shelter you in the midst of your storms. Just like he did with Noah. 
And he wants to rescue you from any trial or tribulation. More specifically, he wants to rescue you from your own sins so that you can be made right with God and have a relationship with him. Today, as we begin this series looking at how every verse points to Jesus, Jesus was there from the very beginning. Let us make man in our image. Jesus was there. And Jesus walked with Adam and Eve. He made you in his image because he loves you. And he desires to have a relationship with you. He desires to walk with you. Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the supreme leader in your heart? If not, then today needs to be your day of salvation. Before we have our, our great time of celebrating the Lord's Supper and what it represents, until Jesus is on the throne of your heart, this is not for you. This is Jesus' supper. It's for his children. Until you invite Jesus into your heart, this is, this is not for you. That's why so you evaluate your own heart right now. See who Jesus is from the very beginning of creation all the way to now. And his desire to have a relationship with you, to live within you. You have an opportunity to respond to that. He's calling you. He's reaching out to you. Right now, you can receive his offer of salvation. Just by saying yes. In just a moment we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. And this is your opportunity to receive Jesus as Lord of your life. If you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins and come into your life, become Lord of your own life, then this is your opportunity to do so. Maybe you're here today and as we are studying this series and going through the Bible and how it all points to Jesus. Maybe Jesus is speaking to you about something else. That's just how incredible our Lord is. He can speak to every single one of us in this room about what's going on in your own life. How it applies to you right now. And as He's speaking to you, I want you to listen. I want you to surrender and say, Yes, God, I surrender to you. So how are you speaking to you right at this very moment? During our time of invitation, I want you to obey. I want you to respond. I want you to do what God's telling you to do right this minute. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, as we've now come to our time of invitation, before we take the Lord's Supper, God, I pray that you will continue to whisper in our ears, speak to our hearts, draw us to you. And Father, whatever it is today, Maybe it's for salvation. Maybe it's for church membership. Maybe it's for following up in believers' baptism. Oh, maybe it's for something entirely different. Whatever it is, God, as we have come to our time of invitation, I pray you will give us the desire to obey and follow through. So, God, we pray that through this time, as we have our hymn of invitation, Father, we give to you. And we just want to submit to you today. In the presence of Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to watch you stand with me here this morning. And as God is